Next, we need to go into the constraints. So we can go through uh, one or two of these just to see how they work, um, but we don't have to go through all uh, four of them in detail. So we have our first constraint, and, and again, instead of, uh, if we compare it back to what we did before, we said, I'm gonna do a constraint list, and in this constraint list, I'm just gonna append expressions that need to be evaluated. Each of these expressions has to result in a true or false assessment. Okay, so instead of doing a constraint list, which, which you can do, here the constraints maybe are a little bit more complicated, especially uh, as you go down here. So let's pick one. Let's look at the, the uh, power constraint. So I'm going to create a new constraint. I'm going to name it something that's meaningful to me. Uh, this constraint, I have to pass to it the model. Uh, and this constraint is going to be valid for every time t. So I'm going to have Pyomo pass to this constraint the model and the time index. We'll see how that works in just a second. But assuming that Pyomo gives us the time index, then we return whether or not my model is producing uh, power less than the maximum allowable power at the given time index. Right, so this is assessed at a given moment in time. And the way you can kind of clue into whether this is necessary is by looking back at our formulation and we see my first constraint was w sub t is less than w max for all t and t. So if you're writing for all time in a set, then we're just going to write the constraint for the one time index t and then ask Pyomo to evaluate it for all t. Let's look at how that's done. So here we uh, have defined our function that evaluates for the one time index. Uh, we create a new function. I just happen to name it the same thing. It doesn't have to be, but I find it useful to name it the same thing. Um, so we're creating a new attribute associated with this function. Uh, we're calling it a constraint, so now we're ass assigning this pyomo.constraint. The rule that we're using to evaluate this is this function we've written up here. Again, these, uh, it's sort of coincidental that these are all three named the same thing. I just find it easier to keep track. Um, so now we have our, our constraint power. That's the rule for evaluating. And then it's going to evaluate this over the um, set that you give it as the first argument. So if you were to leave this blank, it would just, it would just evaluate it you know, once. You just have the model being passed. If you give it model.t, it'll evaluate it for this time index. That is part of model.t. If you happen to have other sets that you're you know, needing to pass in here, let's say we had you know, some set g of power plants, we'd have model.g that we'd pass as a second argument, and then you'd have this subscript index lowercase g that you pass as the argument to this function. Right? So there's different ways to get to the, the result, but um, this is kind of the most basic way of having um, uh, an iterated uh, index that you're going to evaluate each, each constraint at. So that's for the power. Um, let's look at the, uh, the example where we're trying to constrain storage. So again, let's look back here. We have a constraint that's the storage state as a function of time. It's essentially an energy balance. We've set it up where we have one constraint that's valid for t greater than or equal to 2. Another constraint that's really similar, just a slight difference here uh, for time index 1. So we can actually implement that uh, in a single function as follows. So we look here, we have our constraint energy store balance or store balance. So we say if t equals 0, I'm going to make this evaluation, right? This evaluation was um, uh, the first time uh, is going to be uh, you know, just sort of rearrange things where we're just looking at the first time versus the uh, initial state of storage uh, and then the energy balance. Um, if it's not equal to zero, then that means it's greater than, right? It's uh, our subsequent time steps. Then we're just looking at the current state minus the previous state. Right? or the current state has to be equal to the previous state minus the difference. So this is uh, one way of handling it. I will note that this kind of conditional statement it has to be used really carefully. Here we've used it to define a way of returning based on the index t, but the equations themselves are self-contained. Right? There's, no, uh, uh, there's no conditional that introduces additional complexity uh, 
beyond the beyond the way we formulated the problem. Um, that is, like if you try to implement conditionals within a constraint, within a single constraint, that becomes a nonlinear problem. You have uh, instead of a single line representing, you have some break in the line that changes uh, with evaluation of your if or else. So as long as uh, the, re the result is self-contained, right, then you can use these kind of conditionals here. So again, we go back and um, assign this function, tell it that we want to iterate over all indices t and t, um, and, and we're all set. And you can do that same kind of thing for the other constraints.